have your Bibles, our text this morning is going to be Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. So before we did the root series, I had this whole plan of doing the entire month of December um, in Romans 8 and studying four weeks on this phenomenal chapter in Romans 8. But then I hit Ruth and um, ended up doing an extra sermon because God was just teaching me a bunch of stuff. And so now we're behind. So I'm going to try to squeeze Romans 8 into uh, three weeks. Um, And so you're going to have to bear with me. We'll try to figure out how we could do this well. But during this Advent season, I felt like God was drawing me to this particular chapter because it's one of the most amazing, powerful chapters in scripture. And so I'm going to read the first 11 verses and then we'll um, go through these verses and I'll give you some points, um, give me some thoughts from each of these verses and uh, in our time together this morning. So Romans 8, 1 through 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemns sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement will be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile toward God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness." And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead would also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So in the season of Advent, Advent is a time, traditionally a time for the church each year for preparation. Preparation to celebrate the birth of our Savior, but also preparation for our Savior's second coming. It's a time when we rejoice in the hope that we have today because of what Jesus has done, but the hope that we're looking forward to in the fact of what Jesus is going to do. And so I'm really excited over the next several weeks as we dive into Romans 8. Romans 8 is an incredible trek through an incredible mountain range. And when you come to Romans, Romans is an incredible trek through this um, mountain range. And when you get to Romans 8, it's the pinnacle of this mountain. It's like you reach the summit and there's this enormous view of the wonders of God's gift to his people. It gives us the most beautiful picture of our present and our future hope. One preacher says that the greatest book in the Bible is Romans. And the greatest book in the world is, is the Bible. The greatest letter in the book is Romans. The greatest chapter is chapter 8. And the greatest verse is verse 1. And Paul is going to start asking us in this passage that if the gospel is true, if what Jesus did is true, how does that change how you see your life? That's a question I'd love to start pressing into you during this Advent season, that if the promises of the gospel is true, how does that change the way that you see yourself? How does that change the way that you see your problems? How does that change the way you see the world. See, it's easy to believe the gospel, that the gospel is something that God has done for us, but you actually never connect it, speaking to how you see it applied to your life. And one of the key themes in this chapter is the theme of freedom. The gospel, Paul explains, sets us free. See, most religious people, we don't feel free because we're caught in one or two traps. We'll call them the performance trap or the pretending trap. The performance trap is thinking that you have to maintain a certain standard for God to accept you or for God to bless you. And if you fail to meet that standard, then God will punish you and maybe even send you to hell. And so you're always wondering, have I been good enough? Have I done enough? 
Was, did the good that I did today outweigh the bad that I did yesterday? And if something bad happens to you, you begin to wonder, is God punishing me? Did I do something wrong? And this kind of life leads to constant anxiety, constant worry, constant fear, and it leads to exhaustion. Some of you are exhausted because you're trying to earn stuff from God when God is saying, you can't earn anything from me. And closely related to the performance trap is the pretending trap. This is where you're always trying to act on the outside like you have everything together, even when you're a mess on the inside. And listen, church people, we're the worst at this. We're horrible at this. You see some, uh, some of you guys will walk in here on a Sunday morning and ask you how you're doing, and you'll be like, oh, I'm blessed. And then all of a sudden, I look at your Facebook, or I see your life, and you're anything but blessed. You're struggling, you're going through hardships, and um, you're going through difficulties, and you're, you'll make these comments to pretend that you're good, but in reality, you're, you're struggling, you're going through hardships, and we're always trying to maintain righteousness and happiness out there while keeping the sinful impulses hidden in, within us. It's almost like you guys have seen a, in a pool, a beach ball, right? Like, if you ever try to sit on top of the beach ball to keep it underwater, it takes all of your energy and all of your effort to keep that ball under, and you're constantly trying to push that ball under because the moment you relax, that ball will fly straight up, right? And it, some of you guys are like that. You're like constantly trying to keep the bad part of you from popping out, whether it's your temper or your materialism or your jealousy or your lust or whatever it is. And every once in a while, you lose control or you lose your temple and temper. And in that sin nature wriggles out and it pops up and it goes so high in the air and it's embarrassing. And you got to grab it and you got to shove it back down under the water to hide it. The gospel, Paul explains here in Romans 8, frees you from both of these traps. Let's dive in and let's look at this passage together. Look at verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is not a more powerful therefore in all of Scripture and in all of literature in the world. See, this is Paul's answer to his dilemma in chapter 7. Throughout chapter 7, Paul is lamenting about how much he struggles with sin. He's like, the good I want to do, I don't do. The bad that I hate is what I always end up doing. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this life of death? And Paul answers his own question. He says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. And you get to chapter 8. He says, well, but Jesus has delivered me, but I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still dealing with this struggle with temptation or dealing with this struggle with sin in my life. How much condemnation am I going to experience because I haven't overcome sin in my life? And his answer is in verse 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, friends, is a legal term. It means that there is a charge that's held against you. There is a that you owe a debt or you, debt or you owe a payment. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, that debt no longer exists because the debt has been paid in full by Jesus. Charles Spurgeon used to say that for those of us in Christ, it would be unjust for God to hold the believer responsible for sin because that would be requiring two payments for the same sin. Let me give you an example. If my electric bill in my house is high really one month because I like the house cold and I set it on 55 degrees every day and my wife decides to pay the bill and but then the electric company calls me and says you know what your wife paid the bill but the reason your bill is so high is because of you used to have to pay it as well I'd be like BS um, that's not fair she already paid the bill in full and you have no claim on me right if I am in Christ, God can't condemn me for my sin because Jesus was fully condemned for it already. For God to hold me accountable for even an ounce of it means two payments for the same debt. This declaration of no condemnation applies to both your past and your future sins. See, many of us get that the penalty of sin has been taken care of for our past sins, that he wiped the slate clean, so to speak, but they think, and if you commit future sins, well, you're going to have to be held accountable for that. 
But Paul says, not if you are in Jesus. Look, simple question. When Jesus died on the cross, how much of your sins have you committed yet? None. He paid for all of it in advance. That means he has already atoned for sins that you haven't even committed yet. Jesus' death wiped not only the presence of existing condemnation, but he wiped out the possibility of future condemnation. And that means there's literally nothing you could do right now that would make God love you more. And there's nothing you could do right now that would make God love you less. You are in Christ, which means there is nothing to impede or endanger God's love and acceptance of you. See, a lot of Christians think that God loves you more the more you become like Jesus. But God doesn't love you to the degree that you are like Jesus. God loves you to the degree that you are in Jesus. And friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are in Jesus 100%. That means he is just as pleased with you and loves you just as much on your worst day that he loved Jesus on his best day. Let that sink in for a moment. See, this frees you from the performance trap. I don't have to ever be unsure of God's love for me. In all of my mess, in all of my struggles, in all of my sin, in all of my failures, I have the unconditional love and the absolute acceptance of my Father in heaven. And watch this, this also frees me from the pretending trap. I don't have to pretend that I'm something in front of you. There's literally nothing about me that can be revealed that Jesus has not already seen and his blood has not already covered. You might be able to point something out to me and say, hey, Sam, you've got this sin. And I could say, maybe I've got to work on that. But God saw that too, and he has set his love on me anyway, and he has promised to change that inside of me. What are you embarrassed of right now? What is there that you would want no one to find out about in your life? Friends, God has already seen it, and he declares no condemnation. Jesus paid for that in full, and I receive you. This is freedom. There's an old hymn, and the words in one stanza goes like this. It says, long may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and knoweth more, but Jehovah knoweth none. The devil can accuse you left and right of things that you have done. And every one of them may be true. But if you have put your faith in Jesus, when God looks at you, he doesn't see all of your sins, but he sees the perfect son of God covering you. You are blameless in the eyes of God. There's freedom. Go to verse 2. Because the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and that the key word in that verse is that first word, because. How do I know I'm not under condemnation anymore? Because I see this new law working in me, leading me away from sin and death and setting me free. Now listen, don't let Paul's word or the use of the word law throw you or confuse you there. This is not a law in the term of the Old Testament use of the word law, but read that word like the word principle. We used to operate by this old principle, that if we kept the law well enough, God will accept us. The problem was the law couldn't change our hearts, and if anything, it just made us more fearful and more sinful. But now there's this new principle. There's this new law at work in our hearts, this life-giving power of the Spirit. The Mosaic law said, only if you obey good enough, then you'll be accepted. But God says, I'll produce righteous behavior in you through the power of my Spirit. Again, don't miss the connection between these first two verses. How do I know that there's no condemnation in me? Because the Spirit of God is working in me. Listen, friend, the necessary complement to the forgiveness of sins is a release from the power of sin in your life. It's the other side of the salvation coin. If you are forgiven, you will be changed. If Jesus' death releases you from the penalty of sin, his resurrection life, His power of the Spirit will start to release you from the power of sin. The two always go together. 
This is illustrated in the life and ministry and the miracles of Jesus where he would tell people, listen, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. It's kind of this odd pairing when you think about it because often the person wasn't coming looking for their sins forgiven. They were wanting to just get healed. But Jesus did it this way because his miracles illustrated the way of salvation. When he forgives your sins, you rise up and you begin to walk spiritually. And so let me ask you, it's awesome that you believe that your sins have been forgiven. But are you walking? Is your life been changed? Has, is there something different about you? It's a, is there something new about the way you live? Is there something fresh about your behavior because Jesus has forgiven your sins? You've been asked the question before that if you died tonight, do you know that for sure that you'd go to heaven? It's a great question, and you should have the answer for that. If you don't, meet me afterwards. But equally important is the question, if you get up tomorrow, will your life be different because the Spirit of God resides in you? Is your life different because God, Almighty God, lives inside of you? Are you walking? Are you different? Are you behaving different? Are you acting different? Are you loving your family different? Are you parenting your children different? Are you working differently? Are you different because Jesus resides in you? You prayed and you asked Jesus to come in your heart and pay for your sins, but did you let him come in and take over your whole life? Here's another example from the life of Jesus. In John 8, a woman was brought to Jesus and she was caught in adultery. And Jesus looks at her and says, your sins are forgiven. But he also says to her, go and sin no more. In other words, hey, you're forgiven. Start walking. Forgiveness is always accompanied by change. If there's not a change in your life, you really have to question if you've really experienced the forgiveness of Jesus. Because you might be deceiving yourself, and that is a dangerous place to be. And the order that Jesus put them in is important. Neither do I condemn you comes before go and sin no more. It's significant because a lot of us will reverse it. A lot of us will say, sin no more, and then I'll forgive you. But Jesus puts it, neither do I condemn you, sin no more. Why does he do that? Think about why this woman was an adulterer. We're not given a lot of details about her life. And there's no way we can know for sure. But maybe this woman starved for love. Maybe she grew up in a home where her father barely paid attention to her. Or maybe she felt unappreciated in her marriage. And this guy, whoever he was, made her feel special and attractive in her life. Maybe she felt pressured. Maybe this guy forced her, threatened her. Whatever the reason was for her to become an adulterer, for Jesus to say, hey, just cut it out, wouldn't fix the problem. The attracting power of sin was too strong. Jesus had to give her a love and acceptance that was greater than whatever drew her into the arms of this other man. That's why he reassured her of his acceptance of her before he gave her the command to change. He said, listen, what your soul is craving for, it's not in him, it's in me. The arms that you're looking for someone to hold you and comfort you and love you, that's actually my arms. Friends, you find the power to change only when you know the assurance that Jesus has given you, that he loves you and has forgiven you and accepted you. Friends, the gospel message is not stop sinning because that would be an impossible message. The gospel message is behold the beauty and the wonder and the acceptance of your God. And when you do and when you marvel in it, you will have the power to stop sinning. God's acceptance is the power that liberates you and I from sin, not the reward for us having liberated ourselves. This is how he breaks the power of sin in our lives. This is freedom. So in verse 1 and 2, Paul articulates the two kinds of freedom from sin that comes from salvation. By his death, Jesus frees us from the penalty of sin, and by his resurrection, he releases us from the power of sin. And these two always go hand in hand. And then you get to verse 3 and 4. Paul further unpacks the unity between these two kinds of freedom. He says, you see, what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement will be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. 
See, Jesus releases us from the law by being born in our flesh and living the life we're supposed to live, a life of perfect obedience to God's law that you and I would never be able to live. And then he gives his life as a sin offering for those of us who couldn't live that way. That offering, that sacrifice, friends, frees us from the penalty of sins and makes way for the Spirit to come into us and start fulfilling the law's requirement in us, which means producing in us a heart that loves God and loves our neighbor, what Jesus said was the essence of the law. Remember, God isn't just after our obedience. He's after a whole new kind of obedience, an obedience that grows out of our desires. When we obey God because we desire God, when we seek righteousness because we desire to honor God, the desire that could not be produced by the law, it could only be produced by the life-producing, life-giving power of the Spirit. What the law could not do, the Spirit does in the gospel. And how practically does this change get produced in us? It happens, Paul says, when we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What does that mean? Great question. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to their spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. See, walking according to the flesh, walking according to the spirit is accompanied by setting your mind on the things of the spirit. Notice he doesn't say, you set your mind on the spirit, but he says, set your minds on the things of the spirit. Too many of us are obsessed with the Holy Spirit as if he's some kind of force that makes you tingly or emotional or feel good. And they're going from experience to experience looking for the Holy Spirit in their lives. But friends, the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's a person. And setting your mind on the things of the Spirit means thinking about the things that he thinks about, loving whatever he loves, seeking the things that he seeks. That's what you do when you're in fellowship with someone, right? You talk about mutual interests. You talk about things that you love. What are the things that the Spirit loves? God's glory, truth, beauty, justice, righteousness, love for his church, love for his people. Look at Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if it's worth, praiseworthy, dwell on these things. What does the Holy Spirit love? The fame of Jesus, the spread of the gospel message, people being saved, delivered, empowered. And here's the key, as you dwell on these things, the Spirit in you are in fellowship. And where He is, there is power. And so your life begins to bear fruit spiritually. Here's what people don't get. The fruits of the Spirit are simply the result of the Spirit's presence in your life. Wherever He is, they begin to pop up. And the Spirit is present in you to the extent that you are dwelling on the things that delight in Him. And when you think about it, when you participate in, and when you do things that grieve Him, that makes your heart inhospitable to him and his presence goes from your life and so does the fruits. Can I ask you, what if the greatest danger of sin was not whatever bad effect it had on you or someone you love, but what if the greatest damage of sin was that it cut you off from the Spirit of God? What if the greatest damage of sin was that it cut you off from the presence and the Spirit of God. Because a lot of us, we evaluate sin on how bad the effects are. Well, this doesn't really affect anyone else. That's not that big of a deal. This is just between, this is just myself. It doesn't bother anyone else. It's not that big of a sin. The effects won't be that severe. But what if the worst effect of sin was that it grieves the Holy Spirit of God and cuts you off from fellowship with Him? The fruits of the Spirit are produced by fellowship with the Spirit, and you are in fellowship with Him to the extent that you think on and dwell on the things that delight in Him. What if when you sin, it's more than just the effect that it has on you and the effects that it has on people, it affects your fellowship with Jesus? Look at verse 6. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. When the Spirit goes... 
So that it's the fruit of his life and peace. And what drives him out? Verse 6 says the mindset of the flesh. What's the mindset of the flesh? Verse 7, Paul says it's an attitude of hostility toward God. And I'd summarize it in five selves, five different selves. Number one, self-will. It's where you're, instead of wanting to do God's will, you want to be in charge. It doesn't mean that you're engaged in bad things. You're just more interested in saying, this is what I want from my life. I'm not going to ask God what he wants from my life. I'm just going to do what's best for me. Self-will. Secondly, it's self-glory. I want to get the attention. I want to get the glory. I want to get the credit. I want people to recognize me. I want people to acknowledge how good I am. Self-glory. Third, self-gratification. I want to prioritize my pleasures and my comforts and my satisfaction above what God desires from me. Number four, self-righteousness. I'm going to be good enough to distinguish myself and earn acceptance from other people and from God. And then finally, self-sufficiency. I have what it takes to overcome. I can do this. God's there as an emergency backup call, but I don't really need God. I can do this all by myself. See, sin is the big I problem. I take the place of God. Fellowshipping with the Spirit means putting God in each of these places where you previously had yourself. So you say, instead of my will, I say, God, what is your will for me? Father, I ultimately, I want my life to bring glory, honor to you. What do you desire for me? It means that it is about your glory. God, I want people, when they see my life, I want them to be, talk not about how good I am, but about how great you are, how marvelous you are, how wonderful you are. It's not about self-gratification because I know, Father, that if I do your will, that you promise that you will provide every good and perfect gift for me, that you will meet my needs according to your riches and glory, that it is about God glorification. It's not about my righteousness, Father. It's about your righteousness. It's about the righteousness that I find in Jesus. I know that left to myself that I'm a messed up human being, a messed up sinner, but because of the righteousness of Jesus, I can now stand complete in him and I'm righteous, not because of me, but because of Jesus. And finally, it means God is my sufficiency, not I'm sufficient, that because I am in Jesus, the promise is I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. See, as you think like that, the Spirit begins to rise in you, surge in you. Listen, at any point, you could either be self-focused in your heart or you could be God-focused. If it's self-focused, it's going to grieve the Spirit of God and drive Him away. And with Him, the fruits of spiritual life and peace. But if you're thinking the things that He thinks and in fellowshipping with Him, the result is that through His presence, you are producing in you the fruits of the Spirit. Again, what if the most devastating effect of your sin was not the damage it caused in you or it caused in other people, but what if the most devastating, damaging effect of your sin was that it drove out the Spirit of God from your life and with Him the spiritual fruit that God desires from you? I should cause you to pause and think. Look at verse 7. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law because it's unable to do so. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is more of what Paul unpacks in chapter 7. He says, there is this flesh, there's this sinful nature that is totally against God, that will never do what God wants to do, and it's totally for self. And he says, those who are in the flesh, in verse 8, cannot please God. doesn't mean that a person without Jesus cannot have a good thought or perform good actions, but it means at the core of who they are, they're more loyal to themselves than they are to God, and that makes them displeasing to God. Go down to verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now that word live in Greek means he's not an occasional visitor. He's not brother-in-law, sister-in-law that's come for two weeks. He's, he lives, he dwells per, as a permanent resident. So if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. And Paul would say that the amount of spiritual power that you are experiencing in your life has nothing to do any more than how much of him you have, but how much of you that he has. It's not about how much of Jesus you have. It's about how much of you that Jesus has. Are you in fellowship with him? 
Are you dwelling on, thinking on, participating on the things that please Jesus? And how much of what you do grieves him? Let's go to verse 10, finishing up here. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Let me give you three things just from those two verses. Number one, the Christian life is not gradual self-improvement. The Christian life is fellowship with the Spirit. Friends, that's a game changer because you're probably used to evaluating sin on how bad the effects are of whether it, how bad it hurt other people. But if the worst devastation of sin was the grieving of the Spirit of God and cutting you off the power of God in your life, then the Christian life is not about how well you improve. It's about fellowship with the Spirit. Because if that's true, it would make the small areas of compromise in your life just as bad as the big ones. Because even small sins, small areas of compromise would cut you off from fellowship from the Spirit and lead you to a place of death away from life and peace. Number two, coming to Christ is not a return to religion. It's a surrender to a person. I often hear people say, well, I'm trying to get back to God. Or I'm trying to get back to church. And what they're saying is, I want to get involved in some kind of religious self-improvement. I want to be a better person. I want to pay a little bit more attention to God. But listen, Christianity, plain and simple, is surrender to a person, all of you for all of him. The nature of surrender is that it is total. Otherwise, you can only look at him as some sort of suggestion giver or opinion, someone who gives you opinions. I don't know if this is still, still true today, but when I took driver's ed years ago, um, the guy beside me, in my driver's ed class, actually had a break on his side. And I'll say, C.S. Lewis says it this way. Christ says, give me all of you. I don't want a certain amount of your time, a certain amount of your talent. Give me yourself, and in exchange, I will give you myself. My will shall become your will. My heart shall become your heart. Friends, that's what it means to surrender. This is fellowship with the Spirit, and it begins with total surrender. Have you done this? Or are you still trying to be religious and trying to strike a bargain with God? Listen, there's only one deal that Jesus will make. His righteousness and his resurrection power for your absolute surrender. He's not giving you any other choices. And the last thing here, I have hope even if I feel dead. I have hope even if I feel dead. Like the Apostle Paul, even though I'm frustrated by my own personal deficiencies, I know in Christ I have the ultimate victory. The Spirit of God is right now working in me, producing righteousness in my heart right now. And one day he will deliver me physically from this body of death into a world without corruption or pain or death. And friends, I can't wait for that day. Right now, I can have the beginnings of a resurrection heart. But there I'll have a completed resurrection heart and a resurrection body and live in a resurrection world. And that means that if I'm struggling with some sin today, that struggle is not the end of my story because the Spirit of God is in me. That means that the struggle will ultimately end in victory. Did you hear that? Don't beat yourself up because you're struggling. Keep trusting Jesus because you will get victory. If your marriage feels dead today, that's not the end of your story today. The Spirit of God is within you, renewing you, making you mount up on wings like eagle. And no matter what happens with your marriage, your story will end in resurrection hope. And if your life is characterized by some ongoing struggle against depression or anxiety or some chronic physical suffering, when it's all said and done, friends, that will not be the predominant theme of your story because just as surely as the Spirit raised Jesus from the grave, He will raise your body to a beautiful, perfect, everlasting life. That will be your theme. That will be your story. That will be your song. In all these things, the body may be dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Friends, that's hope. And in that hope, there's freedom. 
Is that the life you want? Because if it is, it starts with total surrender to the Spirit and a commitment to grow in fellowship with Him. It starts by receiving those first two words, no condemnation. It's a gift. But so many people balk at it. So many people ignore it. You ever been to a nice dinner with someone and they try to pick up the check and they just wouldn't let you pay for it? And maybe you knew that the person really couldn't afford it, but their pride kept them from receiving your generosity. And as many times as you offered, they just kept saying, no, 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 it's on me, it's on me, I insist, it's on me. Listen, if you insist on picking up the bill yourself, you can, the bill yourself, you can do that. If your pride stands in the way of accepting that Jesus is willing to pay your bill and more, then understand that you're not just, just letting him, ignoring him, you're also rejecting him. Because the full debt will come due someday, and it will be yours to pay if you insist. Or... There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can choose that right now, today, if you want. You know, in this Christmas season, there's two heroes. Especially if you have children, there's the hero of Santa Claus who tells you, listen, if you do good, if you behave, if you perform well, you'll get gifts. If you're good, if you're not naughty, Based on your performance, Santa's going to give you presents. Or there's Jesus. He'll say, hey, you're a jacked up, messed up human being, but you're not receiving this gift of eternal life based on your performance. You're receiving this eternal life based on my performance. See, we possess the greatest freedom the world has ever known. No condemnation. Not because of anything we did but because of everything Jesus did. We have a present hope because our relationship and salvation is real. We have a present hope because we have a spirit living in us and we have this glorious future hope when sin and death will be destroyed.